tremendous pleasure it is to welcome two outstanding curators and scholars amidst us today, not to say that, that they're both dear friends. We have Deborah Diamond and Deepthi Khera taking us through a dazzling exhibition, which has been called A Splendid Land and which is showing at the moment at the Smithsonian. Today's lecture, however, is, is titled differently. It's called In the Mood, Exhibiting Udaipur's Paintings of Place. A brief uh, introduction to today's talk. Around 1700, artists in Udaipur, a court in Northwest India, began creating immersive paintings that expressed the moods or bhava of the city's palaces, lakes, and mountains. These large works and their emphasis on lived experience constituted a new direction in, in Indian painting. With dazzling paintings on paper and cloth, many on public view for the first time, the exhibition, A Splendid Land, reveals the environmental, political, and emotional context in which the new genre emerged. It explores the unique visual strategies that artists developed to communicate emotions, depict places, and celebrate water resources. The exhibition is organized as a journey that begins at Udaipur Center and continues outward. First its lakes and lake palaces, then to the city, onward to the surrounding countryside, and finally to the cosmos. A side trip immerses visitors in the emotions surrounding the monsoon, the annual rain so crucial to Mewar's prosperity. Throughout, a soundscape by the renowned filmmaker Amit Datta invites audiences to fully sense and not just see the moods of these extraordinary places and paintings. Dr. Deborah Diamond is Elizabeth Moynihan Curator for South and Southeast Asian Art at the Freer Gallery of Art and the Arthur Sackler Gallery, the Smithsonian's National Museum of Asian Art. She's currently recataloging paintings in the collection, working on an international loan exhibition for 2022, which is the Splendid Land, paintings from Royal Udaipur, and designing a digital component for an exhibition of Persian and Mughal painting, Writing My Truth, the Mughal Emperor Baba. Her most recent exhibition titled Encountering the Buddha, Art and Practice Across Asia, which was exhibited in 2017, was accompanied by the publications of Paths to Perfection, the museum's first handbook of its Buddhist collections, and an app exploring Tibetan sacred spaces. Deborah received a PhD in South Asian art history from Columbia University in, in the year 2000. Dr. Diamond has curated numerous exhibitions at the Sackler Gallery, including Worlds Within Worlds Imperial Paintings from India and Iran in 2012, In the Realm of the Buddha 2010, Facing East Portraits from Asia 2006, Perspectives, Simran Gill, 2006, Autofocus, Raghubir Singh's Way into India in 2003, and the reinstallation of arts of the Indian subcontinent and the Himalayas at the Freer. Deepthi Khera is an associate professor of art history, Department of Art History, and the Institute of Fine Arts, New York University. She earned her PhD in South Asian art history from Columbia University's Department of Art History and Archaeology in 2013. As an art historian of early modern South Asia, her research and teaching integrate Indian Ocean and Eurasian geographies and engage long jury perspectives from the medieval to the modern. She was awarded the American Institute of Indian Studies Edward Cameron Democracy junior prize for the best unpublished book manuscript in the Indian humanities for her book titled 
the place of many moods, Udaipur's Painted Lands and India's 18th Century, published by Oxford and Princeton, Princeton University Press, 2020. We will now, I invite both the curators to take us through a walkthrough, a magical walkthrough of this incredible exhibition, uh, which Deborah is going to first take the lead and then following her, what, and, and the film that she has, has, uh, is going to share with us, uh, then there'll be a PowerPoint with Deepthi and then all the questions that we want to shower her, then both with, will happen afterwards. Um, it's, we, expect to, we expect the session to go on till for an hour and a half to two hours. So send your questions, keep whatever you want to ask, please put it in the chat box so that I can, I can go through it um, at the end and ask the questions with the, to the speakers. So now, um, just one, one other thing. We have, uh, well, today is our grand finale of our ac academic year, 22-23. We're now gonna be shot for two months, which we're very excited about. But we begin mid-July with our flagship course on Indian aesthetics. And do go to our website and sign in if you're interested. And a lot happening with us in the coming year. So stay, stay tuned in go on by visiting our website or by sending us all your details and we'll send you all the information fine as and when. So on to Deborah. Welcome Deborah and welcome Deepthi. Thank you very much, um, Dr. Bodard Rashmi for this kind introduction and the invitation to present a splendid land at Gana Pravaha in Mumbai. We both sincerely thank the Gana Pravaha staff especially Ms. Sharon Rodriguez for setting us up. Ditti and I are truly honored to share this exhibition with you all and really happy to see so many friends here today. We're going to begin with a short exhibition video. Now it's a promotional clip, but one which we think introduces the spatial embodied experience of the exhibition. And then Ditti and I will launch deeper into our methodological, historiographical and exhibitionary lenses. Our plan is to emphasize curatorial choices, particularly those that propose new ways to encounter and frame early modern court painting. And we very, very much look forward to your questions and the ensuing discussion. Welcome, my name is Deborah Diamond and I'm the Elizabeth Moynihan Curator for South Asian and Southeast Asian Art at the National Museum of Asian Art. And I'd like to bring you today to our exhibition a Splendid Land, Paintings from Royal Udaipur, which looks at 200 years of paintings, many never before exhibited in the United States, that come from Udaipur, the capital of a kingdom in Northwest India. Our partner in this exhibition has been the City Palace Museum of Udaipur. Let's take a journey. One of the great challenges in creating this exhibition was for people who have never been to the Udaipur or who have never lived in the 18th century is, how would they experience these paintings as places of memory and joy? The renowned filmmaker Amitata came and made us an ambient soundscape that picks up from the elements in the paintings and enables us to hear them, to sense them, as well as to see them. We begin in this room with three early paintings from the 1600s, which are all evocations of the mood of poetry, of music, of a sacred Hindu epic, the Ramayana, when artists were working in a very small scale with idealized subjects. The revolution comes in 1700, when artists turn to the large immersive scale and begin depicting their own place, their own experiences. So the artists were trying to capture the bhava, which is the mood, the emotion, the sensory experience of being in the city, which they did by creating this large painting that you could almost enter, the Lake Pichola is at the center of the capital. And if we look really closely, we can appreciate all of the people and animals and temples and palaces that go towards creating this extraordinary mood. 
Our key goal in this exhibition was to shift the Orientalist perception that these paintings are royal portraits of, a, of mindless pleasures of an exotic world and indolent kings. These painted presentations of Udaipur's exuberant pleasures and flourishing ecologies emerged in a very specific political and environmental context. As Mughal imperial authority weakened in the early 1700s, regional kings sought to establish new friends. Paintings of pleasure show us how these political alliances were cultivated. Painters describe the historical moods of pleasure, the politics of pleasure, the labor of cooks, of gardeners, of performers that went into creating worlds of pleasure. We see these relations mapped across the exhibition's paintings, especially those featuring monumental monsoon moods. One of the most dramatic rooms in the exhibition is devoted to the moods of the monsoon, the annual summer rains that were so absolutely critical for Udaipur. Because the semi-arid region relies on those monsoon rains for its prosperity, water harvesting and water resources, and the actual arrival of the monsoon was a time for great joy. And for that reason, in painting and poetry and literature, the mood of the monsoon has been developed. So this is the first painting that we have um, capturing this monumental mood of the monsoon unraveling in Udaipur. And uh, we have the monsoon winds kind of coming from the northwest direction from where the monsoon would come. You start seeing that in a way you're getting a sense of the speed of those rains. Um, so you have this entire kind of, if you are thinking about the ways in which rains and the monsoon season was idealized as the season for love and longing that you see in those small paintings, to be with your lover, to listen to the specific kind of music, to be stationary, to be part of, you know, this unraveling in which the earth and the moisture in the air is being refreshed. This magnificent painting, for example, depicts the Maharana, the king, along with his court, inspecting one of the canals that carries the water runoff from the lakes during a monsoon. This is a painting that praises Udaipur and takes a delight in a healthy monsoon. It's a good flood as opposed to a bad flood. And the artist Shivlal took seven years to create this monumental painting that not only captures the lushness of the hills, the delightful gold, you know, wiggle of lightning, but also the look and the feel of the rain falling on the individual riders as they move across the landscape. Artists in Udaipur were trying to capture the bhav of particular places. And building on that, we've created the entire show as a journey, and each gallery is devoted to the mood or the memory of a particular place. I want to invite you all to come and visit the exhibition A Splendid Land, which is on view now until mid-May 2023. It's an extraordinary opportunity to see paintings that have never been published, to experience the sort of scale and the incredible detail and the shining gold of extraordinary art, and to imagine yourself in different places and different times. Okay, um, can you hear me? Yes. Great. Um, so as you're, as you're sinking into the galleries with that video, I'll, I'll start us off with a key artwork from the City Palace Museum Udaipur. Um, the painting that you see on the screen has been exhibited, published for the first time in a splendid land. On display in the first gallery, it introduces the genre of paintings of place that feature keenly observed moods, memories, and time. It makes us ask, 
what makes a place captivating? What captivated Udaipur's painters? In the second decade of the 18th century, a visionary artist, go back here, a visionary artist conjured the ambience of Udaipur at dawn. You can see the washes of scarlet, gold, and blue that swell and furl into billowing clouds beneath the rosy sky, the capital of the early modern court of Mewar, with its grand city palace, fortified walls, green hills, hunting grounds, villages and temples, surrounds a spectacular lake. City dwellers and villagers go about their morning activity to the sounds of dipping oars, splashing fish, and the scoop and swish of a water wheel that you see there. Dams and sluices and wells signal that the lake is both man-made and well-used. Painted in highly burnished pigments and gold on paper, sunrise in Udaipur is five feet wide. It presents Lake Pichola and the Aravli Mountains as forming an enchanting and sustaining environment for humans and fauna within which Udaipur, as the Pur, the city of the rising sun, Uday, flourishes. Nestled in the Aravli Mountains, Udaipur was established in 1553 as the new capital of the early modern Mewar court, replacing the previous fort capital, Chittor. The city's founder, Maharana Uday Singh II, chose its location on the Girwa Plain for both security and sustainability. Although the semi-arid region was dependent on an unpredictable monsoon, its mountains discouraged invasion and its watersheds and natural depressions allowed for extensive water harvesting. To create Pichola, the lake at the heart of Udaipur and at the heart of the painting that you just saw, Uday Singh's engineers expanded an existing water body. Our 1720s painter also pays special attention to the earliest embankment of the Bari Pal on Pichola and the jagged edges of other smaller water bodies like the Dutalai that you see on the screen. The cows and herdsmen walking along the stream highlight the history of cattle rearing around the small reservoir. Over the years, Udaipur's kings remedied successive droughts and grew the economy by creating many more lakes. Jaisamand, Ratsamand, Rupsagar, Ransagar, Jansagar, and Fatehsagar, to name a few. Local communities built yet more wells and smaller dams. Together, these transformed Udaipur and its environs into a thriving agricultural zone and a water-filled oasis within the dry landscape of northwestern India. However, only by early 1700s, painters focused their creative energies on visualizing the sensorial embodied and environmental experience of the city and its palaces, lakes, and hillsides in these monumental works that extol the Sasodia dynasty's beneficence. Painters thus offered a new subject for Indian painting, the bhav of a place and time. A splendid land focuses on this revolutionary turn, traversing the cultural, urban, and political arenas in which it became imperative to create emotional bonds in a praiseworthy land. Bringing together some 80 paintings spanning over two, two centuries from 1700 to 1900, it explores the poetic and pictorial moods that celebrated place, inspired pride, stirred memories, and forged communities. With an average size of approximately three by four feet and painted on paper or cloth, they are sumptuously colored with pigments from lapis to gold to lap blank and Indian yellow, made from brown minerals and organic compounds. Their scale, as you just saw in the video, means that viewers, like the inhabitants of the city, are immersed in the ambience of Udaipur. And although such paintings have often been interpreted as portraits, the king is hardly ever the central or singular focus of the landscape or the action. In Sunrise in Udaipur, the painting's patron, Maharana Sangram Singh II, appears twice, first in the Royal Barge near Jagmandir Lake Palace, and again on Lake Pichola's south shore, 
with a party out for a tiger hunt. The painting's subject is its mood, specifically the mood of an enchanting realm at sunrise, wherein the mood of the king and his companions on a tiger hunt is one part of the story. I'll move to Bhav. Bhav, which we translate as mood, conveys the all-encompassing ambience and interpersonal connections that makes a place and time memorable. Most in this audience, of course, know, but we'll briefly review the role of emotions in Indian art. Over two millennia, Indian philosophers returned to the question of why artworks move people. Writing in the cosmopolitan language of Sanskrit, they explored the characters, gestures, and settings that would engender emotions and feelings, the affective states encompassed by, this, by the term bhav. From this extraordinary rich and complex literary conversation, we'll highlight two developments. First, by 1000, by the year 1000, writers on aesthetics generally came to agree that emotional resonance is not located within artworks, but rather realized in the bodies and minds of discerning audiences. Indeed, for connoisseurs, feeling bhav led to the ultimate aesthetic experience, the tasting of rasa, a blissful immersion in the core emotion, the core essence of the artwork, often, you know, speaking about interior states such as love and longing. And the second point that we want to flag is that is by the 16th century, how poets writing in a more accessible vernacular of Braj Bhasha, of classical Hindi, um, poets and intellectuals expanded classical Sanskrit's traditions, uh, typologies, and idealizations. In Udaipur, to become connoisseurs, courtiers learned those subtleties of aesthetic emotions through poetic treatises like the Rasika Priya, a handbook for poetry connoisseurs in collective settings. Composed by the famous poet Keshav Das in 1591, the Rasika Priya laid out the passionate romance between the deity Krishna and his beloved Radha, every situation, every gesture, every element essential for stimulating the rasa of desire. Here you see the painter's visualization of the dhira adhira, the sweet, sharp type of heroine who knows her lover has been unfaithful. It includes this, you know, sharp, unreal red band that highlights the lover's conversation in the golden pavilion. And this red band pierces through the vineyards of the green forests and the cultivated fields. Um, as Alison Bush has pithily summarized, handbooks like the Rasika Priya were the price of entrance into the learned courtly circles of early modern India. These schooled Udaipur audiences to feel rather than think emotions, to conjure the ideal words of these poetic, uh, of these poetic uh, genres. So as painters turn to depicting Udaipur's court, uh, you know, turn to depicting Udaipur's courtly connoisseurs within the precincts of the lake city in a new genre, they brought in new bhavs, among them pride in Mewar's abundance and seasons, the pleasures of recalling one's own activities in a lake city. And in one way, the paintings of mood resonate with literary praise of the place that flourished in this era across courts and languages. And in another way, these paintings conjure walking paths and pictorial manipulations of maps. So first, just to continue with poetry, um, urban descriptions and panegyrics written in Raj Bhasha, Nagar Varnans, as well as Persian Shehra Shubhs, emphasize the vicissitude of real places while stirring feelings and emotions associated with idealized abodes. Not just court poets like Nandram, whose verses you see on the screen, which are featured in our galleries as well, um, who forged new affective metaphors like steadily flowing waters in Udaipur's lakes or the pleasures of lake palaces that create a certain ocean of joy, a certain bonding of joy. 
but also urban praise poetry composed by traveling Jain monks who made the city and region compelling, made it resonant, made its landscapes and its, its moods resonant for diverse communities. For example, the Jain Yati Ketil's vantage points are mountainsides and bazaars rather than palaces. His language is boisterous and multilingual, and his couplets reveal the emotional aura and celebrity tropes of Udaipur that exceed genre and media. His emotions encompass the king, his court, city dwellers, and villagers alike. Ketil is smitten by the men and women on the ghats of Lake Pichola in the rosy light of dawn. The painter of the sunra of sunrise on Udaipur materializes this kind of poetic praise for Udaipur as a place radiant with sunrise mountains and madder red skies. Warm yellow washes tint the teal gold mounds of the oblong shaped Mashla Magra and the triangular Thiklia Magra that you see in the corner here. And an experimental mix of this thin and patterned gold outlines add luster to the add luster to the to the kind of uh, um, to these lush mountains and these these patterns around these white palaces so with this with going into this one painting um, through poetry i want to now just for um, two minutes want to show you how these multiple foci how we can think about them through another lens by stepping away from the poetry uh, before we go back into the galleries. So not bound by a singular focus, a standard size, an exclusive kingly portrait, a contiguous viewpoint or a homogeneous temporal moment, such map maker painters freed themselves to combine first-hand observations and aesthetic ideals in unceasingly inventive ways. Walking along the lands from the northwest to the southwest shore of Pichola, artists could have studied the Zanana Mehel, which is marked over here as A, uh, depicted in this upper left edge, followed by the Kovarpadaka Mehel, point, you know, marked as B. Um, the planimetric view of this Vedyanath Mahadev temple, depicted at the lower edge, marked as J highlights his main tower and its entryway. And it's accorded a certain kind of prominence um, as, and it's aligned with the Zanana Mehel. It's a sacred precinct that was patronized and inaugurated by the Queen Mother Dev Kumari in 1716. The axial alignment of the temple on the opposite shore and the Kuvarpadaka Mehel, which I showed you, um, kind of uh, gives us a sense about why certain buildings are highlighted. On the far right, where the tiger hunt unfolds, like it is led by the Prince Jagat Singh. Um, and these kinds of uh, mappings foreground the significance of select landmarks and kin relations. Studying the lake side from the terrace of the Khas Odhi, uh, a hunting lodge with a domed roof pavilion depicted on the lower edge explains the artist's orientation of Jagmandir Lake Palace. For those of you who are familiar with paintings of Jagmandir, this is not some. This is not an image that you immediately recognize. The Lake Palace is presented at an angle not seen in other paintings, entirely parallel to the palace complex on the eastern shore. The composition reinforces the stacked effect the glowing sky of the, of the spectacular rectangular painting. And among such heterogeneous visual strategies, Sangram Singh, in, who is out for an early morning hunt with his boon companions, thus presents only one of the number of portals for viewing this painting. Historically, it was likely viewed in assemblies that included the represented courtiers, who were then able to generate recall and reaffirm bonds to a place at a particular time. So with that, I'll, we'll move to the world of exhibiting from one painting. We'll take you to many more. And over to you, Deborah. Thanks. In curating the exhibition, in curating these spectacular and complex paintings, 
we focused on two complementary and indeed interwoven strategies. The first strategy was to emphasize the sensorial and the immersive qualities of their paintings, their pav as it were. And the second strategy was to deploy interpretive frameworks and visual juxtapositions that would work to counter Orientalist narratives. A key question of course for us was how to address the gap between contemporary audiences and historical viewers. The latter not only knew the locations, but they would also recognize themselves and remember their activities you know, when they viewed the paintings. So because the paintings were made to invoke emotional responses in period viewers, we sought to create conditions for contemporary visitors to immerse themselves in another world and in another time and to linger over and enter the mood of these paintings. Can we go to the next slide, Dipti? We were also cognizant, as Mike Ball and others have noted, that walking through an exhibition is in itself a meaning-making event. And to acknowledge the embodied experience of visitors, we organized the galleries somewhat geographically. We dedicated each gallery, each separate room, to the moods of a specific place or season. In fact, the gallery sequence begins at the center of Udaipur with the lakes and lake palaces, continues outward to the city palace and to the city itself, then moves onward to the mountains and valleys surrounding the capital, and finally, more metaphorically, arrives at sacred sites and, and cosmic environs that happen to look like Udaipur. We then sought to underscore that each room is a distinct destination and mood. Thanks. So in each room, both the palette of the paintings and the wall colors help our visitors make those distinctions. For example, in the moods of the monsoon gallery, we have these purpley gray walls, they're darkish, and um, the paintings often feature like liquescent greens and stormy grays, and those work to create an immediate impression of a monsoon mood. Now sound really strengthens that impression. The extraordinary filmmaker Amitata composed a different soundscape for each gallery drawn from motifs within the paintings, such as in the monsoon gallery, crashing thunder, pouring rain, and fragments of Malkos rock. The sounds invite visitors to lose themselves in a mood and also to look more closely for oral motifs within the paintings, which is particularly useful, uh, a way to sort of unlock what are these incredibly complex, you know, laden images. Now, many exhibitions of Indian paintings place the paintings themselves regularly, even mechanically, around the walls of galleries, which often creates the appearance of postage stamps on a wall. In contrast, and perhaps idiosyncratically, we created syncopated rhythms. The dynamic juxtapositions engage a physicality of response, but they also work, I think, to counter the outdated perception that Udaipur court painters are conservative copyists. So for example, in this close-up of three paintings, yeah, here, um, which all depict the, the same palace space within the city palace. This is the Bari Mahal. Um, you can see how we, we sought to create meaningful um, adjacencies, you know, in order to emphasize how, how the artists themselves experimented like fantastically with focus, with scale, and with playing with perspective and unfolding palace spaces. We're trying to give the sense of an atelier that where artists knew each other's work and, and sort to respond and, and work differently. So on the right, for example, the 18th century painter Shambhu enlivened the very symmetrical space with sharply sh slanting shadows and a floor pattern that mar marvelously skews around a central tank. At center, Gossi in the 19th century achieves this dramatic, almost imploding kind of symmetry by rendering the surrounding colonnade at a 45 degree angle. And the green circle, now that we've put on uh, the slide, uh, shows you the cusped arched roca window from which the king could view the city. And the cloth painting on the left completely focuses on Maharana Bhim Singh sitting within that very same Jaroka window. 
So exhibiting and in fact highlighting this sort of repetition and difference establishes for our visitors the conditions for creating recognition. Even if one has never been to the city palace or been to the Badi Mahal in the city palace, the adjacencies allow visitors to recognize how art is depicted and nuanced both palace architecture and palace mood. Dipti? Yeah, so before we return to the specific galleries and paintings, we want to um, highlight the broader historical context and the exhibition's interpretive frameworks a little bit more, um, and the kind of frameworks that it counters and it enables, that is the Orientalism of Splendid Land counters and the new methods and histories it enables. Um, our focus on emotions, sociability, and uh, environment emerged as we attempted to make sense of Udaipur's hundreds of 18th century, 18th and 19th century paintings of place. Um, however, comprehending representations of people enchanted by wondrous and momentous moods created in and shaped by natural and built environments is far from simple. The study of these works it, it has been dogged by the legacy of colonial histories. James Todd's Annals and Antiquities of Rajasthan, published in 1829 and 1832, has played an outsized role in framing Indian kings and royal pleasures as examples of Oriental decadence. Like other 19th century historians, its author, the first senior British colonial administrator in Northwestern India, saw India's history at this time as one of decline. For the British and European observers, who from the early 1700s to the 1830s, the years all coinciding almost with the death of the Mughal Emperor Aurangzeb and the period that scholars often uh, refer to as India's long 18th century. Um, and its end point uh, is, is the time period in 1830s as the is entangled with as the British were trying to establish forms of colonial economy that would eventually lead to the establishment of the British colonial state in 1857-58. Todd credited the Sisodia dynasty with a glorious past and damned its 18th and 19th century royal patrons for voluptuous inactivity. Such narratives aligned with picturesque landscape aesthetics as seen in a watercolor by Todd's British artist. And these narratives have inflected art historians' interpretations of Udaipur's artworks in direct and several indirect ways. Unlike Todd's dismissive descriptions, um, through the 18th and 19th century, Udaipur's paintings of place interweave politics, panegyrics, and the world's of pleasure created within lakes and, and beyond within the hills in green terrains. By the late 17th century, for regional elites, merchants, religious leaders, as well as mobile groups like scribes, painters, mendicants, bards, the grounds for loyalties, personal friendships, and representation had shifted. Mughal authority was largely restricted to the capital in Delhi, and court cultures flourishing in the cities of Jaipur and Lucknow uh, reimagined their place in distinctly local and urban ways through painting, through city building, through poetry, through cartography. Udaipur's painters and patrons led by Amar Singh II realized the potential of their city's unique locale, microclimate and natural resources to hold new political communities together. It was pertinent as Udaipur's painter, painters and patrons and poets and architects reveal to rebuild exclusive moods, to represent idealized moods and reiterate pleasures for the attuning to affect an ever-changing group of elites. So for example, in the Lake Palaces and Pleasure Gallery, we highlight both the infrastructure of lakes, which enables these spectacular settings, um, as well as how moments of arrival to, to establish a world of pleasure are commemorated alongside plans that painters created for building new lake palaces, right? Um, I can expand on some of these lake palaces and pleasures in the discussion if there is interest. 
um, to talk about how poetics, politics, and pleasure intertwine. But for now, as we are thinking of those who are immersed in these worlds of pleasure, those who are depicted in it and those who are consuming it, I want to return briefly to painting inscriptions on Bhav to understand the sociability shaped by paintings that depict moods of place and time, um, as we see on the screen, as we see in the galleries. As discussed before, while Bhav and Rasa were foundational to both Sanskrit and vernacular aesthetics, thinkers based their theories largely on dance, drama, and literary works. But, one, but a crucial evidence, one that formally and explicitly links Bhav to visual arts, was unstudied until recently. It lies in the scribal notations in Mewari on the backs of Udaipur's large paintings. Several paintings describe the subject of the, the subject of the depiction as the bhav of a place or an event. I started some of the work in this direction in my book, The Place of Many Moods, and a splendid land, it takes this work much further. It includes five paintings, the exhibition includes five paintings with such scribal notations. The mood of the Kota Palace uh, that you see on the screen was likely the earliest painting to be identified as a mood of a place. We have the mood of the, of, of the celebration of the birth of a prince. We have the mood of a wedding procession, the mood of hunting grounds at Nehar Magra that Deborah will talk more about and the mood of a visit to the temple at Sri Ekalingji. The catalogs reference section, for those of you who've seen it, includes the first time translations of, the paint, of all of these inscriptions on the back of paintings, thus offering new insights and also making extensive primary sources available for future research. On some of these paintings, Pithi references to Bhava scrawled along the top of the sheet, on others, they are embedded within longer texts that always name the Maharana, often specify the location and the date of the event, the artist and the date on which the painting was presented to the king or entered the royal storeroom, evocatively called the Jodhan, the container of light. It is not unusual for inscriptions to identify courtiers by their name, rank, and physical location in the scene relative to the king or to enumerate the sequential movements of key protagonists through space and their action over hours. The king and his courtiers likely generated the content of the inscriptions when they gathered around the paintings. Entries in the daily records, the Hakikat Bahira of the Mewar court, show that paintings were viewed collectively in the picture hall in the Chitra Shali, an ornate palace interior adorned with murals. An entry dated to a Tuesday in November 1780 specifies that it was only after the paintings were ceremonially presented to the Maharana Bhim Singh that a scribe was called into the room to produce the inscriptions to write on their borso. We can therefore understand the inscribed texts as indices of gatherings in which courtiers well versed in poetics viewed artworks. Their collectively generated recall and identification of places, events, and individuals speaks to the role that paintings played in stirring emotional responses and engendering shared emotions. The variations in inscriptions and the abundance of paintings depicting moods indicates the scope and scale of experimentation undertaken at Udaipur. So I'll hand it over to Debra, who will take the conversation further. So within the space of the exhibition, we wanted to create this new interpretive terrain, one that would shift the lens from Tamasha spectacles or royal portraiture, um, the spaces in which they're usually understood. And in order to do that, we, we needed to decenter the king. Um, indeed, the compositions and, and the foci of the large paintings demand that we pay more, less attention to the king and more attention to mood, uh, to places as cultural landscapes, to the court as an institution, to the noblemen who were along with the king, both the primary subjects and the primary viewers of these paintings, to the work of pleasure in creating emotional attachments and 
loyalties, to the possibilities and dynamics of friendship, a type of relationship which much of the literature on early modern South Asia says is impossible um, within the court, um, to also pay attention to the labor and the subject positions of servants, performers, and commoners, and finally, and, and in no way least of all, to the ways that artists represented the local and the sensorial. So uh, we'll pick a few of these strategies to show you. We can bring out a few in today's talk. So for example, the large hunt scenes emphasize collaboration over individual prowess within very specific and very recognizable landscapes. So as Dipti mentioned, the inscription on the verso of this painting identifies its subject as the mood of Narmagra, and it was likely written when the king and some courtiers viewed the painting and relived a thrilling hunt. Now, Udaipur's Maharanas cherish Narmagra, this particular hunt ground, for its abundant boar, and they saw virtue in its steep ravines and spiky acacia, and they identified their own toughness and their military prowess with the rugged land. The painter represented the distinctly humped profile of the mountain range as it would have appeared to riders arriving from Udaipur, just to the left of this painting. And they also precisely recorded the course of its river as if seen from one of the hills. And we've mapped that uh, through GIS mapping so we can see the course of the river. And by depicting the, the ground, the, the big terrain from above, the painter emphasized its sort of scratchy and vast expanse. Then upon that terrain, the artist conveyed a sequence of events, the prowess of the courtiers, the experience of a collective endeavor together, and the mood and sensorial experience of hunting at Nord Magra. The inscription, which is quite long, describes this kind of play-by-play -play sequential narrative. It tells us, and the painter shows us, that after the king plunged a spear into the back of a boar, the spear broke off. And when that happens, um, that will leave the, the spear bearer, in this case, the king, in mortal danger. So then a courtier swoops in and he kills the wounded beast. So what we have here is the visual memory of, of a particular day. And its mood is that of companionable sportsmanship, exhilarating danger, and a challenge well met. The Bob is that of remarkable men together enjoying a remarkable land. And this shift in our interpretation and the way we put the paintings in the, in the gallery, we hope will situate the paintings as agents of historical change, as images that played an integral role in forming the social bonds that maintain the new political order. So just to reiterate, in these large hunt paintings of which we have several, it is rarely the king who is killing the animal. These are paintings that celebrate a, a collective. And thus we can see how the large hunt scenes like the large palace scenes played that role in forming social bonds. Next slide, Dipti, if we can. Throughout the exhibition, we underline that the large paintings of plays cannot be disentangled from the political and cultural shifts that swept India in the 18th century. As Imperial Mughal political authority lessened by around 1700, the grounds for allegiances shifted. So in order to build new alliances, North Indian courts and Mughal successor states all had to reimagine their realms. And for many of those places, building up cities and mobilizing the arts were key strategies to create new loyalties. So in Udaipur, at the turn of the 18th century in this politically volatile and shifting landscape, we find Maharana Amr Singh II reorganizing the Udaipur court to establish a powerful inner core of 16 noble houses. And perhaps the earliest painting of this inner circle, so it's dated around 1710, by style and subject, depicts the courtiers celebrating holy with the king. The Thakurs are seated by rank, and their names are listed on the back of the painting with a formality that recalls official documents. But they are equally, and no less importantly, enveloped together with Amar Singh in a joyous haze of gulal red that expands into the glorious red blossoms of the surrounding gardens. This lush painting, 
reveals that both the new political hierarchy and paintings of the court enjoying collective pleasures in wonderful places emerge together as entwined phenomena. We have the next slide. So to convey this point, thanks, Dipti. To convey this point, um, I mean, the point here is the imbrication of politics and pleasure. Um, I just wanna uh, present sort of the way we did the slides. So I think as many of you know, the titles that we now see attached to Indian court paintings, they are later. They were applied by art historians or royal families or collectors, museums. And 90% of the time, maybe 95% of the time, these titles situate the king as the subject of the painting. So the official title of this work, which you could see at the bottom of my slide in italics, is Maharana Amr Singh II and Courtiers Play Holy in the Sarvavitu Vilas Gardens. And that title begins with and centers upon the king. So for the gallery label, because we can't change the names of other museums' paintings, um, so for the gallery label, what we did was we created label titles. And those label titles tell the viewer what they can read about and what is the main point. So they, they will draw people in, we hope. For this label, we deployed the title Power Play to emphasize that pleasure and power were productively entwined in 18th century Udaipur. And it's a point that we feel we need to make repeatedly because our audiences, audiences in Washington, DC, typically walk in the door with this idea that pleasure is non-productive. And that mindset unfortunately supports this kind of orientalist notion of politically irresponsible kings and their correlate mindless artists. So um, if I may, I want to return one more time to place and specifically to the notion of cultural landscapes. Do we have another slide? which Dipti and I mobilized for both the catalog and the book. So considering that India's rich visual traditions center on the bodies of gods and royals, it's really actually quite remarkable that artists in Udaipur produced between 17 and 100 and around 1940, hundreds of very ambitious paintings that depict Mewar's riverine plains, its forested hillsides and its monumental monsoons. The recent turn in humanities, which in art history included, towards pressing concerns of ecology and climate change provided a ground for bringing landscape to the forefront of our research. A Splendid Land thus offers the first art historical study of Indian court paintings as portals onto cultural landscapes, that is landscapes that evolved through human use. By mapping the landscapes and reading them in relationship to recent studies of early modern South Asia that connect aesthetic, political, ecological, and historical memories, we present the scenes as cultural terrains in which the king and his courtiers saw themselves enacting relationships not only with each other, but also with, with the built and natural environment. So for example, the paintings encode historical attitudes towards land use and natural resource management. You know, as an example, I mean, the most dramatic one is water, because in the form of lakes, rivers, tanks, dams, wells, and fountains, water is omnipresent. It appears in every single painting, except for one in the exhibition. The ubiquity of water reveals the economic and cultural value of that very precious resource in the semi-arid monsoon dependent kingdom. And that was also um, a hook towards contemporary audiences who may, who may be very concerned about climate change. The Smithsonian thinks that climate change is the existential threat of our time. So we were able to bring that lens onto the paintings. So here, for example, we see the king and the court crossing a sluice on horseback to inspect a canal. Uh, next. Uh, Dipti showed uh, this cloth painting earlier, but what I point out here is that fully half of the painting is devoted to the sweep of the monsoon coming in from the Northwest. And then this very precise mapping of the artificial man-made lakes, um, sluices and the Ahar River. Um, so fully half of the painting. Uh, what do we have next? Dipti, slide. Um, or um, in many of the paintings, this is one of Sri Eglinji Temple. Um, 
we can see the artists give a lot of attention to depicting the, the water infrastructure. I mean, here it's a well, often it's a, a bound or, or a dam. And so those appear in every single painting. The earlier art historical focus on, on these paintings as portraits, I mean, it seems crazy, but these paintings were considered portraits and titled as portraits, I think has blinded many of us to the endlessly novel solutions that artists devised to tell stories about Udaipur's landscapes. If the king's portrait, his luminous profile presence rarely changes, the king's place in the natural world inspired endless variations and flourishes. For painters, the background was intoxicating. It was the locus for innovation, a space to showcase their dexterity, and a fruitful source of love or mood. Over to you, Dipti. Thank you, Deborah. So towards uh, concluding our talk, I will discuss the creators of mood while also signaling the ways collaborative and dialogic conversations are included in the galleries and the catalog. And these will hopefully also point to the kind of conversations that may expand in the future. So apart from the inscription translations, uh, the reference catalog begins with a report from the conservators at the City Palace Museum who conserved the paintings loaned to the exhibition. Uh, Saloni Gwalewala, who I think is in the audience, so a huge shout out to her, uh, S. Giri Kumar, Anuja Mukherjee, Bhasha Shah, and PM Vasundara provide an insider's look at the establishment of the conservation lab as well as the insights from the first stages of you know, what uh, will become even a more expansive and comprehensive project to conserve these large paintings, to perhaps do more pigment analysis and so on. Another collaboration that I want to point out to is between pedagogy and uh, uh, between curation and academia. So 10 graduate students of the Institute of Fine Arts, New York University, spent the semester in spring 2022 before the exhibition opened in a curatorial seminar that Deborah and I taught. Immersed in painted landscapes and themes explored in the exhibition, um, they, uh, they have, you know, you can see their new the kind of new research that they have created on topics ranging from poetry to pyrotechnics, from sensory experience to animal husbandry. And these were developed by guided close looking experiences and historical research on 10 paintings. Their curatorial labels are featured in the galleries as conversations with our labels. We call them curators in the show. They are featured in the galleries. And here's a link to the website where you can reach, you know, where you can reach longer pieces on the interventions they have made. Um, and so, you know, in terms of bringing, in terms of the kind of methodological uh, arenas that Deborah and I have flagged, uh, of course, we've sought to bring together South Asian aesthetic theories on emotions with insights from the sen sensory turn in contemporary scholarship. But we've also tried through that process to disrupt the division of art and artistic practices into pre-colonial and colonial frameworks. So I want to take you through that route into a painting in the early 1900s to think about some of these deliberations. Uh, painting in the early 1900s, the painter Panalal Parasuram Gaud makes the felt boundaries of inside and outside the theme in Maharana Sajan Singh so in this painting titled Maharana Sajan Singh celebrates the festival of the goddess Sitla. Built in the 18th century for the South, um, amid bus bustling bazaars and uh, away from the main gate of the city palace, the temple was cons consecrated to the goddess Sitla, who was celebrated on the eighth day, the Ashtami of Holi for protection from pox virus diseases that spread with the arrival of warm seasons. On a busy day, women flock to the shrine on the left as the king holds court on the right and men rejoice after worship with dance and song that you can see here. Panalal, 
who led Udaipur's painting atelier in the first half of the 20th century was inspired by photographs as well as painting. A photographer works from under his black cloth at the center of the composition and the cropped spire, temple spire, the strong diagonals and the shading of faces suggest a photographic aesthetic. As the photographer looks in one direction, he stands with elites who gaze every which way, wearing pantsuits, the attire of Parsi merchants and carrying umbrellas. Tucked on the top right, a group of women lean on the walls to peek in on the outside of a well-guarded compound wall. On the bottom right, a second group with, with pot clusters at the gate to get a glimpse. Under this arched bower, a man looks in but does not advance. On the left, a gardener standing barefoot on soft tufts of grass peers over the well, of, over the well-guarded compound wall. Their collective individual and collective yearning is palpable. It turns the spatial barrier into a keenly felt boundary of caste and class. However illusionistic, the tall tree in the center together with the strip of the path and greenery along the lower frame creates disparate spatial compartments like those characterizing much earlier devotional paintings. If inside and outside separate elites from non-elites, left and right are gendered to convey other emotional affects. These large paintings expand upon the pleasures of male assemblies within the mountains, gardens, and palaces, and temples by Udaipur's lakes and hills and bazaars to center the sociability of men within this within this rugged abundance of land. But doing much of the work that went into creating worlds of abundance were women and numerous go-betweens, messengers, attendants, cooks, servants, record keepers, musicians, elephant riders, and more. We conclude by opening conversations about those who were at the center of creating moods, but are often relegated to the margins of paintings and unmentioned in the inscriptions. Painters observe the world around them so capaciously that paintings offer tantalizing glimpses of the non-elite women who contributed to the moods of refined pleasure. With sensitive precision, artists portrayed the expressive bodies of dancers and musicians imbuing courtly gatherings with sonic and swirling moods. We can follow two female performers over the course of four paintings created between 1764 and 67. In deep red and orange robes with flowing pleats, they enliven both moonlight stories and springtime celebrations. One night in the Bari Mehel, by the light of a candle held up by a servant, surrounded by male accompanists, and watched vividly by connoisseurs, the pair gracefully, the gesture gracefully while the king is engaged in worship elsewhere. On another day, opulently dressed and seated in the Jagmandir Lake Palace, they wait for their performance to start. Although the dancers are identified in the inscriptions only by their profession as bhaktan, a term that denotes a range of singers and dance, dancers connected to Krishna worship and within court settings and temples, their recurring appearance suggests that they were cherished, they were well-known performers. And while the project tries to trace their names and details is still unraveling in rather tantalizing ways, which we can talk more about, the artist Shambhu over here you know, inserts his self-portrait in proximity to the dancers, drawing attention to their role, to their role, to his role and their role, the painting artist and the performing artist as creators of mood, to his role as a painter of bhav. Thank you. So there are, uh... Lots of questions um, that we could begin with. I have lots of questions myself, but I'll wait for mine. Um, 
Uh, Vijay Sagar talks about, um, would it be possible to go through an inscription on in the reverse of the painting as we look at the painting? Is If that's possible at all, then we, that would be a wonderful exercise. And uh, the other one is that how can we determine which particular incident is being depicted in the painting? How much can Bahis help with this? So, um, yeah, so we can begin with these, yes. Kitty, when I was when I just saw that question while you were speaking, um, the last part, um, I was able to sort of open up um, some Gram Singh and Jai Singh, like playing holy. And um, so I could I could share that image and and read the inscription, and we could use that as an example. Does that work for you, sure. I think? Sure. sure. Okay. Mm -hmm. Let's see if I can do this. Does the painting show? Yes. Yeah. Oh, yes. Good. Sure. Okay, so this is a pretty large, like four foot uh, cross painting, which also depicts Nar Magra. Uh, daytime on the right, nighttime on the left. And um, I'm going to read in English the um, inscription or translation. So, the encampment of Sri Maharaja Diraja Maharana Sri Sangram Singhji is on the riverbank at Narmagra, where Raja Savai Jai Singh arrived at his encampment. So, his encampment is on the right. There, now they're talking about what's, sorry, they're on. Jaipur's on the left. Now they're talking first about the right. So there, um, the king and many Thakur sat. Pancholi Vaharidas Das Ji sat. Priest Sukram Ji sat. Rajkirat Singh Ji sat. Rawat Keshri Singh Ji sat. Rao Vikram Deet Ji sat. Ratwar Bhim Singh Ji sat. Maharaja Umed Singh Ji sat. Thakur Hati, I can skip, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, names, 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 sat. Next to Jai Singh, um, um, his four, four Rajput men sat, after which Pancholi Rai Chanji sat, Dai Bai Nangji sat, Wis Carrier Tulsi Dasji sat, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Dave Do Lalji, the tent manager, was called to bring out the ceremonial uh, cloth, but a poshak for gifting, which we can actually see up here. Um, then Ram Singhji held the whisk among the Rajputs. More and more, they tell you who sat behind the king. Um, later, they arrived at the outer tent, tent, which is here, right? Later, they arrived in the outer tent where Jai Singhji put saffron on Sangram Singh, and Sangram Singh put saffron on Jai Singh, and everyone together played holy. Later, so they're using terms like later and then and next. And then we can follow this, right, across the river. So later, they all went to Jai Singh's tent. So they came across. Now it's become nighttime. So it's darker, right? You can see um, there are torches being held. It's darker over here. OK, so back to the inscription. Later, they went to Jai Singh's tent. There, by torchlight, the royal assembly was conducted, and all the talkers played holy with Sangram Singh. End. Wow. Incredible. So, sometimes it's pretty easy to follow, although when we were following this one, it was the first time I think that I, you know, saw that artists were um, not only, you know, sort of depicting the actual course of the river and the shape of mountains, but also in, in telling the story, sort of perceptually creating that difference between daytime and nighttime by like, mm. by using a dark waxy surface, uh, black goopy stuff you know, to darken the landscape. Um, so this is a case where it was writ fairly easy to follow it. In some of the inscriptions, it took us weeks, weeks, I think, to, to align the text with what was happening in the paintings. And then as Dipti uh, has spoken about uh, or written about in the catalog, we also have inscriptions that go beyond what's in the painting. So they will uh, mention the name, it could be the names of the artist, the date of the event, 
the date, often a year later, on which the painting was given. Um, sometimes the amount of rupees that each artist received for giving the gift, and sometimes also incidents that happened after uh, what's depicted in the painting. Yeah, so if I, I'll just add briefly there also to say that, you know, that is what the, that is what is really fascinating that you can get the you can get the temporality of the scribe's response to what is depicted, but you can also get the temporality of when it is perhaps entered into uh, entered into the store. But in one a very interesting case that you know the sunrise painting that I showed in the beginning, so it actually includes an inscription which says says that the kind of gift that was given to the nobles and everybody who were present at that time in a different location in the palace. And it took us a very long time to figure out what that inscription is doing over there. Um, and so, uh, so possibly the painting was seen at that time and that is why that gift is mentioned over there. Uh, in another case, we are specifically signaled that as the painting is being entered into the store, um, who all is present when the inscription is being written. So there are about three people who are there who are also represented in the painting, but the others are not there, <laughs> you know. Um, so the Eklingji painting, there we get a sense of like that this is the mood of Eklingji darshan. And that darshan is not defined just by the darshan in the central chamber, but that darshan is really defined by arrival at sunrise, you know, being in one part of the tank, you know, the Indra Sarovar, ending with a picnic that is taking place in the Bagela Lake. And that landscape is very, that land of Eklingji is very clearly mapped. So it's not just about the temple, but it's about that sacred land. And what is it bound by? It's bound by these water bodies and pleasures within those water bodies and traveling through that entire land and completing that at the end of the, of the, of the visit. And twice you get in that inscription. So this is about the bhav of Eklingji Darshan. So in that sense, it also kind of expands. And I think more research will enable us to think as to when bhav is used, when it is not used. And one thing to keep in mind that there are very expansive paintings where the inscription might be very, very pithy. But we've found that, you know, for example, the famous Jag Mandir painting of Ari Singh, where he's there that we show briefly in the gallery walls of like him moving with his beloved. The inscription is very pithy, but we've been able to figure out that actually painters are engaging in a very expansive conversation of developing like the mood over time, but also having conversations with poetry that is being composed at this particular time in a very, very, giving us cues of that um, in very specific ways. Um, so there's a way in which sometimes inscriptions exceed, sometimes they are very pithy. And so you kind of have to do that work together to see where you arrive. So response starts making more sense because each gathering is different. And in each gathering, a scribe may be different. And what you get as a result of that conversation in that gathering is what the inscription results as rather than the other way around. But they could be, but they could be different gatherings and sort of, you know, so how do they decide which, which one they should be writing, you know, which is the one that they should be recording. You know, there's obviously, there's obviously some selection process there because it's not like the paintings were just shown once. But yeah, there's obviously yeah. an occasion when they're being shown and that is the occasion they would like to record. So yeah. Are, you know, I think yeah. that one thing that came out like from the very kind of tedious inscription that I read um, was how inclusive they are and how many talk boys and noblemen and servants um, or servants of the court, you know, are actually mentioned in these. So I, I think that's pretty crucial, even though it begins with the king, yeah. you know, all of those other people are mentioned. So. Well, that's where you talk about politics and power play, but, you know, there are elements of that as well. The moment you're, you're including names, you're writing down the names, which right. means you want to keep them for posterity. They're important in, in that context, in a historical context. But what's extraordinary to me is how much more the painter included. 
especially when I think about people who are commoners. So there are often men, they may work for the king, but they're hanging out, they're smoking their hookahs, they're not paying attention, they're doing their own thing. Women are shelling peas, mahouts are sleeping with their camels. I mean, there's, there's like a, in the catalog, we call it the aesthetic of plenitude, which gives us sort of an extraordinary amount of information about um, where non-court people are located and what they're doing. I mean, and, and things become very clear I mean, such as the labor of, of women. Women are working really hard in these paintings. And someone on, on one of the questions had asked, you know, if Bahis can help us with this. And Dipti's work on the Bhaktan of Jagat Singh uh, revealed that we, he had two favorite dancers and they keep, these two women keep appearing in, in paintings. So I think that if we had not had our um, research cut short by the pandemic, we would have been in those bahis and we could retrieve those women's names. Mm. I mean, they must be in there somewhere. Have so, to. Um, that's kind of where I think bahis can help more as we find more of them. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. And they did, and they do keep records all the time. I and mean, we know that they do it even today. So they are keeping records of what's happening every single day. But again, I wonder how selective that is. You know, what is it that they choose to record and what is it that they choose to omit? So it's not like it's uh, that everything is recorded. Yeah, so, yeah. I mean, it's, I think that's why you're kind of reading with all of the evidence, right? It's the Bahis that have enabled us to think about a little bit more about what the context of response and context of viewing them is. It's the Bahis that are along with the visual record where in some ways the visual record is enabling some of these people to be present more than what you might find in the Bahi, I would argue. Um, so in a way you kind of have to look uh, between these records to see then how you're able to thicken the story. And the story on the Bhaktans of Ari Singh between 1762 and 67 is thickening up very well. It's, you know, one is finding a lot of evidence from 1780 onwards. It's the 10 decades and 10 years in between that I'm still looking after to see what one can say. What, what one finds subsequently, yeah, like needles in a haystack. Yeah. So Kavita has a question about what is the terms equivalent to landscape in uh, Mewadi or Braj Bhasha, or do we have words like base for land? So is there a word for landscape? That's basically a question in, in Mewadi or Braj Bhasha. We have not found a space that refers to paintings as other, you know, other than Pano, you know, or Tazbir. So, you know, we parse why we use landscape and how we understand cultural landscapes. But Kavita, I'm not sure that we have any paintings, we have any terms that would that would encompass large paintings, paintings of place, paintings of mood, landscape. I, I don't think we found anything like that within the records. Okay. In fact, I think it's perhaps worth thinking that it's not that category that they are after in a way when they when they bring in the question of mood and specific times or specific places in a way they are entwining the two and not necessarily you know separating something into a, a singular term for landscape we get terms which are identifying specific lands you know whether it's a beer land uh, where the, you know, where the cranes would be brought in, uh, whether it is a particular kind of well, uh, whether it is, a, you know, so we get specific facets of what has been done in the land by humans, which get identified. So that is the mode in which land is marked and it is invoked rather than as a category um, as a broader category, one would say. Otherwise, so it's really it's, the built landscape that you're talking about. Means, talking? I think it's the built, it's also the what is done to the natural landscape, but it is the relationship between the human and land that is what kind of emerges in the record in some ways. Okay. Although we could be using more precise terms, like in the in the book and in the in the exhibition, I think we use beer for like the sanctuary land, you know, and Iran for a certain kind of flat land. 
But we can also tell from the paintings because they depict like wells and water infrastructure so much, we can also tell you know, from the present, which were the lands with high taxes and which were the lands that were low taxes. So there would be terms for different landscapes or different types of land, at least based on tax revenue. Yeah. If that helps. Yeah. Um, there's a question from Rhoda. She says, you speak of Holi as an example of politics and pleasure. Could you give us another example? Well, it's true, they showed two Holi paintings, um, but there's a group of paintings that show some Gram Singh and, and Savai Jai Singh. So in one case, they're playing Holi. These are like, I call them like G2 meetings, right? Instead of G20, G2 meetings. In yeah. one case, they're in a lake palace, you know, under the moonlight, you know, smelling flowers. Another time they're in a, in a tent encampment um, outside a lake, again, smelling flowers. Dipti, there's so many, you wanna name a few? Yeah, you know, name it's what is interesting is also to think about that a how the specificity of where the holy is played and you know where the holy creates a certain kind of mood, a certain kind of pleasure and politics is something that can really be differentiated. So, for example, what Deborah is pointing to, you know, with the 1720s, 30s meetings between the Udaipur and the Jaipur. Kings, we actually have those meetings mapped in Nahar Magra as she showed. We have them on the outskirts of the city, on the banks of Ratsamand, where they are not playing holy, but spring and smelling flowers and flowers being sorted by laborers outside the encampment and being provided a fresh supply of that is kind of building the mood. And then they are seen in a pavilion uh, of the Jagmandir Lake Palace by the lakeside where you, the painter has very carefully given us details of the flowers from the Jagmandir that only Sagram Singh is wearing to create a certain kind of an ambience, right? And with the holy paintings, it's also interesting. I was very excited to find this one figure, both in the paintings and in the inscriptions of the merchant, uh, a group, you know, the merchant and his assistant who sell the holy color. So they are painted very prominently across the holy darbars with these large uh, chabechas, these large plates, and the holy powder is being given. And you actually have somebody noting in the accounts, and the inscription is actually saying that uh, is about gulal vechta hai. So mm. it's not about just telling a category, it's about the action of selling. So since you know you saw in the paintings how the Golal pigment and how that is painted, the painter is really using that to make a point about the kind or the mode in which the collective is being created, the mode in which that place and time is being transformed. Uh, very, I'm very keen to actually find this role of the social history of those who sold color and how they were brought in in these darbars. And is there something over there to think between the gulal sellers and the painters? Um, so those uh, that's again like giving you a cue, giving us a cue as we, that these are the kind of figures that can be traced through these large paintings that painters are really emphasizing. Sometimes inscriptions pick up on them and sometimes they don't, but you can actually follow them to actually arrive at other kinds of social histories, roles of a lot of people that are very much kind of that painters are paying extensive attention to. True, true. And also I think, I mean, when you had paintings of Holi, it's also an aesthetic, choice because because of the color the, i mean you're using color also i mean if you're trying to create mood and and it's, it's so multi-dimensional the layers of meaning that are being created and the aesthetic is not in any way being compromised by the by the political so the political message is coming through but they're doing it in in so many different ways so I think Holi becomes a very, very important uh, time for, for bonding, for celebration. For, for, and it's very important in that part of the world. Very, very important. Even today you have Holi as a very important festival that is, that is marked and celebrated. 
as you as you would know for sure. Um, yeah, and Deborah has traced this even in the Jahangir period beautifully. So you know you can then think of a longer meditation on this for various purposes. The aesthetic is what is creating the political in that yes. sense. Yes. And uh, Rhoda also wanted to know an example of an inscription which relates directly to the bhava of the place. Is there any inscription that talks about a bhava, a particular bhava of a place? So there are several, and I think uh, in this exhibition, as uh, we mentioned, we have five paintings that have bhav of a place or a time in the inscriptions. Um, and uh, and that's not to say that those are the only means. There are others that are there in other collections that are there in this 1890 uh, Bahi that is there, that catalog that was created of paintings where you find several paint, uh, paintings that are identified as the bhav of a place or time. That is how the entry is made in the catalog entry in 1890. Um, it's also like the placement on the verso of paintings is interesting for bhav that in some cases, like for example, I was saying in the Eklingji painting, you have it there almost it as a title, and then you have it embedded again in the very lengthy inscription. Um, in some cases, it's there just as a title. So that is also what has kind of, um, uh, what that has kind of, we took a decision earlier on and both Deborah and I were very clear about that, that paintings that have bhav of a place or a time in the inscription that we were going to title those paintings as such mm -hmm. and uh, all of the collections and the museums agreed to that and we were grateful for that because we felt that was a title that was coming from uh, how the scribes titled them. So this direct evidence and it's not just an interpretation that you that's coming from you it's not your way of reading the painting but it's actually there within within the painting. Uh, Ted Barr from Tel Aviv, Israel, he would like to know if there are current talented artists from Udaipur. Are there any contemporary, is there any contemporary art there? Yes, many. There are, but I'm not sure how to sort of elaborate on that without going to a totally different place. But, um, Maybe Veronica at the end can come in and name um, for us uh, many of the talented artists working there today. I hope yeah. Veronica will do that at the end. Thanks. Yeah, she could do that. Veronica is there with us, so she could perhaps, we could take it to her at the end. That would be great. Uh, there is a um, question about bhava and rasa, which come from ancient Indian theories. Um, and are seen in these medieval paintings. Any chance there are reflections of another ancient theory, the Chitra Sutra in these paintings? And we know the Chitra Sutra is from the Vishnu This is a question from Amol Holi. So is it just when we talk about Bhavarara? Yes, you mentioned you mentioned the Rasika Priya, but the Rasika Priya is a is more of a Naika Bhed, Nayak Naika Bhed uh, compendium coming from the Rasamanjari. Really, it's a, it, I mean, the, the Rasamanjari was earlier in Sanskrit, and then you can see that with the coming of, uh, of uh, Braj Bhasha and that poetry, so it got it was necessary. But, uh, but the Chitra Sutra has a whole different language. And so the question is, uh, does, do they make any references to the Chitra Sutra? That's basically what the question is. I, I think that um, one way I want to answer or not answer this question is, is to emphasize why we focused on Bhav and Ras. Um, there's, there's almost nothing in, in all of the sort of vast sort of corpus of philosophical thought on aesthetics that actually tells us how people respond to paintings. And here in Udaipur, at this one moment in time, we finally have information, specific information on reception. Mm -hmm. So we focused on that and, and, you know, on the one hand, in terms of history, and then on interpreting and looking at the different ways that the artists did that. So we see artists you know, certainly using things like 
um, you know, idealized figures with lotus shaped eyes, which have that very long history, or, you know, only showing the king, you know, in a luminous profile. Um, and using a sequential narrative, which we know from as early as, you know, Sanchi Stupa, you know, mixed with very sort of perceptual modes of observation from walking around or looking at how light falls or, you know, very specific architecture, and also how they drew from at different moments, uh, Indian maps, uh, city plans and architectural plans, as well as photography and European and Mughal imagery. So that's just the way that we focused our inquiry. Yeah. Yeah, it means I would just add that in some ways, we, our focus as Deborah is saying was to historicize the use of these terms as conceptual categories uh, as much as possible. So in some ways, you know, I, I think Rashmi, you know, these earlier texts more than any of us present in the room. Uh, so I would turn the question to you as well. But I think the sense, you know, when we invoke and think about what is taking place in the Rasika Priya or how painters are responding to those emotions, we really kind of think of that in terms of seeing how that has changed and also how if it is invoked if some of if there is a for, if there is a way in which say the the question of a springtime visit to jagmandir is invoked in a way where the bands of red and green you know lush vegetation kind of really invokes the visuality of a rasika priya kind of manuscript then what is the, that specific conversation taking place between, say, the poetic ideals that are celebrated by poets and painters in the mid and late 17th century versus when they are turning them, uh, turning to the environs around them? How are they entangling them? So in that sense, we are trying to be very precise in how these invocations are used, and it's for that precision that we turn to contemporaneous poetry because contemporaneous poetry that is about description, the varnan of these environs enables us to think about the walking paths of our artists, the modes in which they are constituting their attachments to place. Um, so th in that sense, those fragments, the visual and the poetic, and the modes of surveying their land, mapping their land, then entwine for us, I think to give us a very thick, in some ways, intellectual, painterly, uh, pictorial understanding of Bhav. And in some ways, we would want that to be taken as seriously as a poetic, intellectual, philosophical tradition from the past, because these painters are making interventions at that level that you can then think about what constitutes bhav at this time through the visual. Um, so it's both to historicize, but it's also to place them at that plane, their innovations at that, at that equal playing field, if you will. I think the point, the question then that what becomes very important is that what is happening in the 17th and 18th century in this area where, where it's become, becoming center stage, you know, that, mm. that they are talking about Bhava and Rasa once again, and it's not in, in Sanskritized courts, but it's now in courts which are in vernacular, in other languages, in popular vernacular languages. And there's obviously... I mean, which Alison has done a lot of work on this and she's talking in the Riti Kalin poetry, we do find that happening. So there is a kind of a, of a, of getting back or retrieving that, that knowledge which was there and make, bringing it again. And I think Bhakti played a huge role in it as well. Bhakti in the, in the 16th and 17th century it does. And uh, that's why we do get, we get a lot of literature on that as well. Uh, thank you, that was wonderful. And uh, I think there are several other questions we have, which we'll, we will be able to go through because I think everyone's very curious. And Niyati Shinde asks, which year was the painting that had the photographer? 
the one that you showed, 1900. Yeah, that's early 1900s. We don't have the date behind it, but I think the, it can be dated even more carefully. It's within the first decade of the 1900s. So, uh, but that's, uh, that's what we have right now. But we have a lot of, uh, we have a rich collection of Panalam Parsuram Gore uh, across various collections. So hopefully that can help us date it further, but it's within the first decade. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, well, this is a question which I had always, I've been wanting to put, uh, I'm very concerned with the word, with curating itself and the challenges that it poses. So there is an exhibition. Um, there is a question, what are the challenges you faced while curating this exhibition? How did you conceive this idea for, the ex for this exhibition? And if you could take us to the preparation or curation process of this exhibition and catalog creation. That's a long one, big one. Okay, what are the challenges we faced while curating this exhibition? The biggest challenge by far was COVID and the pandemic. Our libraries were closed. We couldn't finish our research in Udaipur. We had a lot of wonderful help from scholars in Udaipur while we were working on this, but very slow through the medium. So um, we sh all of those challenges, everybody can imagine and know. So I'm not gonna dwell on that. Um, we also, as curators, will always have the challenge that any given museum will tell you how many lenders you're allowed to have because each lender costs a lot of money and requires a lot of staff time, right? So um, we, we're not telling the story um, that we wanted to tell, um, drawing on every single Udaipur painting that we wanted to use but we very cleverly disguising the fact that we had seven lenders, our largest lender being the City Palace Museum in Udaipur. So those are challenges. Um, Dipti, can I go on for conceiving the idea? Yeah, please do. So, so you know, a maybe a million years ago, um, I met Dipti when she was working on her dissertation and I was really excited about her work on Bob and the fact that she was working with Udaipur paintings and many of them are quite large and I've always like loved Udaipur painting more than anything. And I felt that um, if I can be anachronistic, but, but anachronistic here, but the, the Udaipur painters emphasis on immersive experience and emotionality would connect to contemporary viewers. Um, in the United States, we have a lot of sort of, you know, Van Gogh experiences right now. Um, and people like appreciate sort of entering in. And so here we have like an historically attested um, prefiguring of what seems to be a contemporary passion. So I also really um, love the opportunity to work with paintings of different scales because you can really enliven the space. So those were all the reasons why I was very excited. And then it got even, and plus I want, you know, first you will notice I wanted to work with Dipti. Um, but then the other thing was is that we started visiting Udaipur um, and Shriji back in 2014 with my then director, Julian Raby. And everybody, both institutions were keen on doing an exhibition that would create a long lasting reciprocal relationship that would result in benefits um, within Udaipur as well as you know, benefits more globally. So we had, our museum had a small hand um, in um, Udaipur establishing its painting conservation workshop, which is like completely world-class and um, which will be you know, ongoing you know, now forever. Um, and we are in discussions this very week, in fact, about sort of how we can keep you know, doing things together in the future. That's a long answer, so I think I'll stop there. Dikti, would you like I'll, to add to that? Yeah, first thing I actually want to give, I just saw, and I'm sorry if I'm missing any of the other Udaipur conservators who are present here, but I just saw that Bhasha Shah is here, so big shout out to her. She's the full-time conservator at Udaipur, who's probably worked the most on all of our paintings that came from the City Palace Museum and who's patiently answered all of our questions and trying to think about how the paper is joint, 
in the future kind of wanting to do research on all of the different paper sizes that are used to create these large paintings to diagram the backs of each of these paintings um, to think through some of those aspects um, I think like you know as Deborah said any exhibition starts off with the uh, starts off it requires uh, it's been a huge learning and it's you know of working with multiple institutions with multiple specialists with multiple challenges coming up uh, when it's almost a decade long project in terms of how uh, priorities change how budgets change spaces change uh, <laughs> and so of course you know like we started with a very very ambitious ideal checklist i remember telling uh, you know deborah and deborah's like okay put put everything there put your master list of all <laughs> the collections and then we'll get a number as to how many collections can we actually borrow from and then it was uh, then it was really a case of how we would maximize our loans and what was the story that we wanted to tell with those loans and our City, I would say our City Palace Museum loans, the very strong collection of the National Museum of Asian Art itself, both of those were the pillars around which we then built what we were getting from other collections and how that story uh, was being told. Um, how many paintings do you have in total? How many? We have around. 80 paintings in the catalog. We have around 65 on display at in Washington, DC. You know, some of them will not travel to Cleveland. Uh, you know, the idea was also to be have to have slightly different versions of the show in both the museums, that they both have something new to offer in terms of what you get from them. And uh, and also restrictions on uh, light exposure for certain paintings and their conditions. And one thing I would say that, you know, uh, you know, even subjects or paintings, for example, like the monsoon or the pleasures of lake palaces in which I've been immersed for a while. Um, it's been a very, uh, it's been a very insightful, humbling, uh, mm -hmm. learning experience that even as you write for them for many years, you research them for many years, when they come together in a gallery, they have uh, invoked entirely new questions and viewings for me and seeing those juxtapositions. So even as a co-curator, if one has created those juxtapositions, what then comes out of to use Deborah's word to out of those propositions that you put on the walls, is is still um, is still something new, and uh, is taking one in different research directions. So that is uh, that is both exciting but also humbling. With especially these large works, because Rashmi, you asked about in which assemblies they were seen, when were they seen again? So to some extent, one has to keep that question open ended as okay. to. Exactly. what mood or what meaning or what metaphor was kind of brought to the fore in which assembly and right. thus it led to which inscription or it led to no inscription or you know what are the limits of our historical worlding even as we try to think about it with all of the contemporary aids of sound of juxtaposition of being able to really zoom in um, and that's um, but I think that is what uh, kind of getting to the question of historicizing emotions and moods is that you have to realize the limits and the um, and the the um, that it's changing. It's ephemeral. Yeah. But it's very center stage. It's very important. And that's the first time that you all have done it through these paintings, because it hasn't been done ever till now which itself is absolutely groundbreaking. There's no two ways about that, that you've used every sensorial uh, aspect of it, whether it's sound or color, I mean, you know, everything. So, you know, when you have sight, it's not just that, but it's also how color is showing up. And then you use it in a very, uh, you know, uh, it's unbelievable what you all have done, I mean, frankly, but I'll come to that in the end, but there is another, 
uh, uh, question from Nupur Shah, which says that pleasure seems to be the wealth and charm of 18th century Mewari royalty. I disagree there, but anyway, what could we say brought about such an ideological shift towards the individual's interior landscape, which the painting seems to externalize? Deborah mentioned water as being the unmissable motive in a land known for its vast deserts. Could we surmise that certain social disharmonies, political anxieties were being repressed that would explain this obsession with pleasure? Or, as the same, it goes on, or were these paintings India's version of art for art's sake? Is Mewari art the first instance of Indian romanticism? It's a lot. Yeah, there's a lot. So I'll take some of it as it were. Um, pleasure or, you know, pride in Udaipur or creating an attachment or celebrating friendship. I mean, pleasure is one word, but I don't know that it covers all of the kinds of emotional attachments that are taking place. However, what we could see as we look at most paintings up until, you know, the very late 19th century, what you don't see, if you see in one or two instances are years with bad monsoons. Mm. So those are actually quite rare. Um, so in one case we have um, from a 19th century painting painted in the month of August, an extraordinary monsoon. It's like totally like an amazing lush landscape. We know exactly when it was painted and we know that it was given to the court a year later and that year was a drought. So that's not depicted. We have one painting of a very bad monsoon year within the exhibition. Um, so that's an example of, of, of things, I, I suppose one could say that were repressed. Um, on the other hand, I think that aesthetic of plenitude, that th there it feels almost sort of a compulsive sort of inclusion of people of all these different classes, often people who are ignoring the king and doing their own thing. I think that that creates like a space for us, you know, in the present day to perhaps um, recover individual subjectivities or at least sort of understand hierarchies of class and sort of spaces of exclusion. Um, so I'm, I'm not sure that I would call it an obsession with pleasure in part because I also feel like some of it is quite familiar from our present day. You know, for example, New York City, you know, constantly, you know, calls attention to its own greatness for its own citizens. So it is a, it is very positive, um, but it's also pretty inclusive. Uh, I'll just add over there that, you know, pleasure, has many terms that we have, we are using the English term, but it's translating many terms, right? Vilas, Sukh, um, you know, which are, which are translated and constituted very specifically. And it's not as if they are constituted in, um, only in this time period. We know Dao Dali's work, who has looked at this question in a much earlier time period in the contemporaneous same time period, Catherine Butler Schofield is someone who's looked at the question of music and pleasure and thought about the role music and pleasure play in kind of how is, how is it reorganized in compendiums to actually address certain political anxieties that are playing out in 18th century Delhi in that sense. So I, I would say that in some ways it's one, the question is not about whether it's, you know, that pleasure is taking a certain center place only at this time in Udaipur. The question is that how are they doing it? Um, and why is it taking a certain kind of a local, of, of, there's a very kind of local mode where they are constituting it over and over again in very, very specific ways. So in a way, I would say that and I don't think in some ways Velas or so in any instance is actually always kind of brought into the archive, into visual or poetic expression 
through thinking about an interior landscape, if anything, it's very, very visceral, very corporeal, very expressive. And it's that which is kind of made as the mode in which pleasure constitutes the self, if you will, and the collective. So I think in the, that is also something to kind of, I think, keep in mind. And in that sense, the obsession is that, you know, what you're pointing to, we are in Northwestern, you know, as Deborah said, we are in Northwestern semi-arid land. Nothing was more precious than water. You've made a city that is full of lakes and reservoirs. Um, you, that is what you could celebrate the most. And in some ways, what you could circumscribe the most for boundaries where the practice of pleasure could take place within the lakes itself. Um, so it's a very specific mood. Uh, it's a very specific shift and it's a very specific um, obsession in which political anxieties, I would say, are, uh, you know, political bonding is part of how you create it with pleasure rather than keeping it separate. So I think reading anxieties into it is very possible, but it's possible only once you historicize that practice of pleasure. And it may not be that much about an interior, but it might be actually about everything that is going on in the exterior in some ways. Would I just add something here about pleasure? I think if we are taking the, the aesthetic theories as the fountainhead for, 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 for the understanding of, of pleasure of beauty and joy it is that was the ultimate that was the summum bonum that was the ultimate goal of all artistic experience was to was to feel joy and the joy is within us and it's a question of how the joy is has the is objectified and by then finding a resonance with that with that joyous object that we find the joy within us so it's not it's not pleasure in the sense of uh, well that's also a joyous i think the word we could perhaps change it a bit more is that what you really the rasa theory talk rasa is joy rasa is bliss there's no difference so it's finding that bliss finding that joy within oneself through through an aesthetic experience is what the goal is so yeah. I don't think that one can look at this as this is in fact a very uh, an understanding. This kind of an understanding, I think, is a very Orientalist understanding of saying 18th century was a century was you know where pleasure seems to be the wealth and charm. I think that itself needs to be uh, needs to be readdressed. In my opinion, of course. Yeah, I means I think that's the reason you have to conceptualize it from <laughs> multiple archives to fill it up, right? Yeah. To not think of it as an overarching thing. And you mentioned earlier about bhakti and so on. So at Kishangarh, as they are, as they are formulating the question of vilas and pleasure, in that bhakti is what is playing a very important role in looking at their places and those experiences and who become the protagonists of that, right? Oh, uh, Kavita uh, presented a fantastic talk in thinking about that in terms of Avad and what is going on. So I think it's when we start filling up these various localizations, in a way we arrive at kind of what, if it is doing a certain kind of work in this time period as well, to establish a certain kind of bliss and a certain kind of bond, um, then it is from these different locations where it's very specific. Thank you. So in the space of the exhibition, so which we have you know, lots of people coming, some of whom have never thought about India, but or the people are coming with their own contemporary modern day prejudices. I mean, the strategies that we've used, figuring that we have sort of 63 little stories that we can tell, besides you know, wall chats and the embodied experience and walking this through is there's a couple of points that we keep hitting you know i mean in the space of the exhibition you know what what i think works is to talk about 
how these were politically useful. I mean, it is in, we're in Washington, DC. Um, how these are politically useful, sort of how they built friendships and interpersonal relationships. So those are the kind those, and of course also, you know, sort of how artists were creative and how they, you know, the work they did to create this. But I think those were the two that we used because we know a lot of people are walking in the door, even as they're, it's a paradox because they're coming for pleasure, but even as they are distrusting pleasure. So, um, and then in the last room, um, you know, where we really focus on the cosmos, you know, that's also where we get into sort of bliss and pleasure and heaven and enlightenment. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Um, Prince, so if uh, one thing that I want to add, uh, Rashmi, is that it's been, you know, in talking about learning experiences, I think it's also been a learning experience as one has talked to visitors and, um, you know, given tours and so on, is that, uh, you know, it's it's difficult to do this kind of sense work on pleasurable sensorium in terms of going into the historical archive. And then when you're using that same method in some ways or aspects of that method to, uh, to create the exhibition experience so that there are, you are maximizing the opportunities for embodied experiences, right? But the, the slippage, the kind of line between pleasure, you know, again, it, it drawing back into for certain visitors, kind of drawing back into a certain kind of an oriental pleasure is is very blurred, right? And that is some of that is bound to happen, even as we try to kind of mitigate that. So that for me is something that as an academic, I'm very now interested in kind of digging through that a little bit more and thinking about that. Yeah, absolutely. It is going to be it's going to be such a great um, service to the cause, you know, to to art and to be able to understand art through that through those lens. It's going to be wonderful. I really look forward to that. Well, so what was the main reason for which the paintings were made in bigger format? in this period, the ones that you talk about. Why did they suddenly discuss, decide to have paintings three feet by four feet? That's a question for you. Someone's asked. We don't have a written reason why. Mm -hmm. um, we only can tell you the work that they did, that they became more immersive, that you could enter them, that you could look at them. They certainly allow you to look at them collectively. Um, and they um, do actually sort of, I think sort of kind of embody this kind of Udaipur aesthetic towards grandness and towards large size. I mean, for me, the question is why didn't they go larger earlier? But Dipti, do you want to add to that? I'll just say that, you know, at this point, there are lots of, we can't come to, we can't look at one starting point or one reason that leads to this shift in scale. There are, we can think of multiple kind of trajectories that lead to that. So, and, you know, uh, uh, Dr. Andrew Tofsfield has also, you know, has pointed us in those directions and we are very much building on a lot of his work of bringing this corpus together that has enabled us to then go into specific questions. Um, and so we have an exchange with artists from Kota where they are painting ex extensively on the walls uh, uh, and those large format paintings, some of them translated into not as big paper paintings, but slightly bigger than our smaller, you know, manuscript paintings are playing a role we know about the exchange with maps and how both the size and materiality of maps and the conventions of maps are playing a role. Um, so there are, uh, so, you know, and then you can think about, uh, you know, that there is a new patron who has had these journeys, Amar Singh, who's wanting to, who want, who's wanting to and who needs to establish himself new. And I would say that the painters are the ones who are giving him the means that this is the experiment that we are going to do that's going to enable you to look at your place again in a new way. 
and present it to your world. And that will enable you to kind of reclaim it in a certain way. So we think that is, and we can trace very specific moments during the 1710s, 1720s, when there is further experimentation in large sizes, then you don't have some very large sizes at certain times around 1820s, 1830s. Ghasi, an artist, again, makes very large paintings on paper and cloth. And I've discussed how they are tied to what he's trying to claim through paintings of devotion and pilgrimage with the expanding uh, British colonial regime. So there are, we can point to specific reasons and things that add up at specific times. Uh, so before we, uh, I know we, uh, I know you guys, everybody has to go. I just had two uh, questions and there's several more, but I think we'll have to now, um, unfortunately not take them all. But uh, just one, uh, do we find this depiction of mood in any other painting, in any other atelier, in any other style, like other Rajput? or Pahari or Rajasthani or whatever you want to call it. Do we find any instances of these kind of paintings where Bhava is depicted? Or there's talk about Bhava mm -hmm. being depicted or experienced? I haven't found it articulated. Yeah. That's the short answer. We find an engagement with Bhava, but we don't find the assertion of that category. But maybe for the research, I I think we might find something in what happens in Kutch in the mid 18th century, just from looking at what they do with the paintings from Udaipur, but there hasn't been much work on that corpus. It's waiting to be explored. Yeah, yeah. So, and so my last question is that, um, so how was this exhibition received by the public? I'm sorry to put you in a spot, but- No, 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 no. I, I, the Smithsonian is, if you want to know about an obsession, the Smithsonian is obsessed with visitor surveys. So we, we do have, you know, the beginning of our visitor survey back. So one of the things the Smithsonian um, does is, or its ethos in testing is that most people who come into an exhibition are going to say it's good. They're coming in for a pleasurable experience and they're going to say it's good. And then some people who really like the exhibition will say it's excellent. And that doesn't even count for the Smithsonian. What they <laughs> want is people who will say two, two things. People who will say it was better than excellent, which they call superior, um, and people whose minds were changed when they came in the exhibition. Wow. So um, in, in, in this case, um, a Splendid Land changed more minds than any other exhibition that we've surveyed over the last 20 years. So it's very hard to see this little sheet here. But um, if you look at the bottom three squares, um, you can see that the number of people who, Dipti, I can't read the numbers. This is so sad. Sorry. The number of people who came in and had their, who expected to be, ugh, come in, ugh, all of a sudden left and it was like superior. So that's why it has a really high rating. But we we don't totally know the reason. I mean, we don't know if it's because they're like, oh, pleasure can be productive. Um, <laughs> or wow, paintings are big. Um, we do, what we did ask about was the soundscape and, and to what extent the soundscape, you know, helped in the experience. So the visitor comments that we have often have to do with the role of sound. Um, but, but I have to say, I'm like totally proud and excited that we were able to flip so many people from indifferent to passionate. I think, you know, it suggests that we've made rasikas, you know, out of passersby. Thank you for asking. Bravo. Yeah. And we can, I don't know if you can read, but, you know, that's what we learned. The exhibition surpassed our historical benchmark. It also exceeded expectations. Significantly more visitors rated it outstanding on exit than on entrance. And they were able to collect a lot of data about that comparatively. Um, and I, um, so we hope we made them into resikas and we also hope yeah. that you know, I'm responding to, I think there was a question that I can't find as to, 
that Indian painting, Indian art is not just about miniatures, uh, that it is also about these large monumental paintings. And so we uh, hope that we were able to, even at that very basic level, that we were able to get them to have that vocabulary, to have that in their imagination. So just as you have changed <clears throat> the titles into newer ones, I think the very category in miniature needs to change. It is, uh, it was used, it was put together as a very convenient way of description at some point. What does it really mean? It's just Indian painting. You know, we did a whole semester on Indian painting and this was what came across right through. There's no such word as miniature. It's not, it's, they're not this big. <laughs> so to call it that and to continue calling it that, let's put it this way, is itself a bit of a misnomer, I would, I would suggest. But on the whole, <clears throat> everybody is, uh, has, is kudos to both of you, both of you for having taken us through what has been a scintillating experience. And what you've really done, what you've really done first is that you have started off our um, endeavor to understand a curatorial process in a manner which is gonna be very hard to follow. So which I hope that the other curators that we invite from other for other exhibitions to make us, to help us walk, walk through the way you have, uh, they're gonna have a very high benchmark. But thank you so much for doing this for us and for all of us who have been, who have been invested in this exhibition one way or the other for a few years, but have not been able to see it. This was, this was, um, this was the, uh, the best that, that could happen. So thank you for taking us through it. Thank you for your time. And thank you for, under, for putting the word curating again as, a, as an accomplishment, which is not easy to get. So thank you so much. And we mm -hmm. hope to have you in person with us the next time you're lying in India. We're going to kidnap you from whichever part of India you are and bring you to Gantrava so that we can actually have you with us in person. So take care and a big, big, big thank you. Thank, thank you. you, Rashmi. Thank you, Gyan Pravaha. Thank you, the audience. The pleasure was ours. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Thank you everyone for joining us and we hope to see you soon again.